Hi, I'm Sonali Kohatkar, host of Rising Up with Sonali, and I'm here in Atlanta, Georgia, with Yes Magazine, which has partnered with the Decolonizing Wealth Project for an historic conference called A Light, A Line, A Rise, focused on the issue of reparations and how it can be achieved. We've been speaking with uh, people who are movement leaders, who are panelists at the conference, who are attendees, about what reparations means to them and how to achieve it. And uh, we asked all of them one common question, which was if you could wave a magic wand and have one thing happen immediately to further the cause of reparations, what would it be? And here's what they all had to say. If I had a magical wand and I had one thing, I want there to be the guarantee of cessation and non-repetition. I never want to think that generations 10, 15 down line, or even three down line, uh, are going to come face to face with the horrors and the atrocities of the past history of my ancestors. So to have a guarantee that what we are dealing with today, the racism and the oppressive behaviors, that it, it will stop and cease and desist and we'll never have to worry about it again. So that would be my magic wand. I, I love this magic wand question. I wish we could find one of those magic wands, right? But between now and 2024, I would recruit thousands of people who could run on the local level, on the state level, and on the national level that would put reparations on the top of their policy agenda. The movement has surfaced the contradictions and, and laid the question bare to all of us, which is why we're in this conversation. And we need a resolution. And one of the places, not the only place, but one of the places that that, that, that contradiction could be resolved and the question could be answered is through public policy. And that's the job of people in those positions. And we have too many people in those positions that don't have the courage, uh, don't have the context, are not accountable to movement, and are unwilling to, to move this along. It's not a complicated issue, actually. You know, it's actually a very simple issue. When you think about the natural response to genocide, the natural response to serious examples of mass oppression, the natural response is reparations, right? And we easily as a culture say never again when it comes to a whole list of horrors and atrocities and genocides. But when it comes to black folks and indigenous folks, it's generally, well, let's just get over it, right. right? That doesn't track. There's a, a basic violation of the core logic of never again in this area, and we need to write that. And so if I raise my, wave my magic wand, we would enlist a mass movement of people who saw it as part of like a broad justice agenda, reparations, right? We need to, to settle the score. We need to get right as a, as a country, as a people. We need to address who we are. I mean, it's not a magic wand. It's call your member of Congress, meet with them constantly, individually and with your group. But also, like, build coalitions within your community around this issue and other issues. The majority of Americans feel beaten down by the system not just wealth inequality, but, but when you look at um, affordability, wages, lack of money to invest, when you look at all of the issues related to quality of life, the majority of Americans are struggling, so they're tired. And so what gives us hope and energy and strength is when we connect with one another. We need to build toolkits to support grassroots organizing and grassroots movement building in each community, like mutual aid networks for political uh, empowerment. If we do that, now when you call Josh Gottheimer or whomever, you're doing it with numbers, numbers that can get that person out of office. So it's not even a magic wand. Um, it, it can happen, I think it will happen within the next decade.
Oh, yes, my magic wand would be for President Biden to sign an executive order right now today, bringing H.R. 40 into existence. H.R. 40, the commission to study and develop reparation proposals for African-Americans. It's just a commission to sign the legislation, bring the commission into existence so the commission can be formulated. It can do its work about studying the issue and devising uh, proposals. That would be my magic wand, because when that is done, that brings us much more closer to atonement and healing. All of the money going to law enforcement, going straight to community programs. Community programs that are led by people and not directly underneath institutions and governments that are people-led and that don't have the oversight and surveillance from government. We know what we mean by community programs. So give us the money and we'll know exactly what to do with it. Okay, I, I, if I would wave a wand and we would all <laughs> um, have free housing. That was a major movement after chattel slavery. People had to find a place to go. And we're still, you know, beholden. That's why many of our ancestors were beholden to sharecroppers. We were still on their land. After 40 acres and a mule, land was given and then taken back and given back to the former slave owners. And then they made our ancestors pay rent <laughs> on the land that was supposed to go to them. And even Martin Luther King, before he passed away, he was leading the charge, one of the people leading the charge on the fair housing movement. And seven days after he was assassinated, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson got the uh, Fair Housing Act passed through. Housing is a major issue with the issues with climate change that we've already known were coming, but now are smack dab in our face. We are going to have to have, we're going to have more and more housing issues and we're going to have to have solutions. So if I could wave a magic wand, we'd all have free housing tomorrow. I think what's uh, pressing for me in this moment is restoring our relationship and connection to the land. Mm. I think even as people are talking about air quality and wildfires and things of that sort, I think what would be beautiful is trusting our indigenous kin to teach us how to steward the land well and to restore connection and right relationship to it, to the land. Because I see land back not just as a return of what was stolen, but then a reversal of what's been uh, damaged. And so I, I see that as a part of reparations because what does it mean to change the world and then there's no world to enjoy? Funding, give a shit. I, Cause I could tell you a whole bunch of people that will tell that story right. And they need the money to do it. The truth is that the stories that we need to be told. So we launched Build Power Productions last year and we committed to telling the stories nobody wants to tell, that everybody's scared to tell. We don't know how we're going to get all them things made. We're going to do it, but we don't know how. You know why? Because it's not just, it's not the people that don't want that story to be told. I've heard, when I first got to L.A. 2007, Danny Glover was trying to get a, a story made about Toussaint Louverture. He's been oh, wow. trying still. That was, he, he had been a decade into getting, trying to get that thing made and just a play. And then a movie, like, 10 years in, when I got to L.A., yeah. that's Danny Glover. You know what I'm saying? I ain't got no Danny Glover clap. <laughs> I am not Danny Glover. You know, but I'm over here, like, connecting folks and seeing where those resources are going to come from because they're not going to come from the institutions that benefit from covering up those stories. Yeah. If we show the blueprint for revolution, if we show the blueprint for healing, <laughs> then we have to upend the oppressive systems. Right. And I think that people understand that and are scared of it when they benefit from those systems. You know, I hope the funders here, we have um, over 40 foundations who are coming to this conference, which is really mind blowing because we didn't build this for foundations necessarily. Um, we invited a few of our funders but there was such a, a growing interest in this issue from philanthropy. So I hope that they come and they be get, they get politicized, that they're not here just to be flies on the wall and to like learn and be curious, but they leave with concrete commitments to fully resource this movement because on a few million dollars that we've been able to provide, I mean, it's been explosive. And so I can only imagine that if we're able to fully resource this movement in the way that it deserves, that so much could happen. 
all Confederate statues, all Confederate, all uh, schools named after Confederate leaders, streets, bridges named after Confederate leaders, gone. Not to say that uh, these that that history can't be taught um, in. Uh, in other places, um, it should, you know, the, the history of the Confederacy should be taught in schools, should be taught in museums. But what we choose to honor in public plays an important role in, in shaping a culture. So right here in Atlanta, um, they have a beautiful memorial to Martin Luther King and Coretta, um, where they are actually buried. And then there's like a, an, um, a voice box where you can hear MLK's speeches throughout the day. You know, those are the types of people, MLK and others, all of the other fallen black soldiers who um, we don't know of, um, don't hear of, they need to be commemorated in public space. So the first thing for me, an important part of reparations, an important part about narrative is changing what we choose to memorialize in public. Um, there's so many beautiful black stories um, and other stories uh, who are really American heroes that uh, deserve to be honored in public. So that would be at the top of my list. It would be to have a national sober conversation about how we got here and how do we move forward. Not the rancor, not the yes, no, you know, taking sides. But I think America is overdue. The world is overdue for a reckoning, a truth and reconciliation, just a conversation because there's such discord. And I think the legacy of chattel slavery, the current legacy of anti-blackness, which comes from that because after you know, emancipation, we then had Jim Crow, we had legal segregation, we had apartheid. And today, black people in America live as second class citizens. Too many do. It sounds like hyperbole, but that's that's the fact. Our rate of involvement with a criminal justice system, our rate of well-being, our wealth gap. These speak to a community that's under stress. And I think America and the world would benefit from a sober reflection about how we got here and a commitment to change course. Every black person in the United States has an opportunity to go home to the continent of Africa. And in that trip, they get reacclimated to the land. They get to understand the language they learn what their last names would have been, could have been, should have been. And that that serves for them as like this firm bedrock from which they can stand on and know that they're not from this space and nor are they of this space. I think it's so important for folks that don't have that, you know, that history to connect themselves to. And like Irish have it, right? The Italians have it, the French have it. And it sort of serves as like the core value system for them. And for black folks, you have stripped us from that. And so at the end of the day, we think that we are what you've given us to be, right? What you provided for us to be. And in reality, we actually come from some of the richest soil, the richest people, right? I was in Benin and there was no police. Community was safety, conscious was safety, ancestors were safety, right? So you didn't violate trust because the ancestors were watching not because the police were watching, right? And so for me, those core pieces that I think that our people would experience if they went home could dramatically change, right? And that's not compensation, that's restitution. What I really want to do is wave the magic wand and let our communities have the space to engage in the ways that we really want to engage in. To be able to engage without being feared of being persecuted, without fear of being arrested because you're going out registering folks, without having to worry about childcare, without having to worry about whether or not you have to choose the, the, the gas money to do some community organizing or whether you have to choose the, the medicine that you need or, or the food that you need or the rent for your housing. If we just had the space to do what we do, right? I'd like to see that situation because I believe that at the end of the day, that makes it even more worthwhile when we get the thing that we're eventually going to get, when we get to the to the mountaintop, as, as, as Dr. King said. And so I think that's how I would use my magic wand to just be able to do that. If we had that space, then I'd know that we'd win and we'd get to where we want to get to. Right now,